So guys, today I'm going to attempt, I'm going to take a swing today at a sermon that um, many preachers have attempted and probably fell to their face with. So I'm going to take a try today. It's on a topic that is not as fun as you said to preach on, but very, very, very important and relevant. And that's the topic of the tabernacle. A lot of reading, but not today. So relax a little bit. I'm not going to read much today. You'll go right into it. <laughs> I know how this goes with this topic in itself. But the idea was that to reveal today Christ in the tabernacle. Now, the word tabernacle, we know is a dwelling place. But to put it together with our theme today, the fact that there's a purpose and reason for each part of the tabernacle how it all points to Christ. Because the goal is that we get to know Christ, right? We all want to know Christ, we want to get to know him more, understand why he did what he did, why he came, and to get a better understanding of all this because when we get to know him, we get to know ourselves, we get to know the Father, and it comes together very smooth at that point. But what happened is, it's hard for believers to get a chance to take time to study out certain things because it sounds boring, not very interested, it sounds dated, and we lose interest. And for myself, it took many weeks and months just digging out piece by piece here and there, and even today, I don't have it all on this topic. So the little bit I do have, the little bit I do have, I'll give you guys today. And there we go. Nice. So this place, this tabernacle, before we get to the tabernacle itself, let's talk about the history before we get to this place in Israel's history. So Israel was in captivity for 430 years in Egypt. And God sends Moses to go and free his people and bring them into the wilderness where they will worship him in the wilderness. Now for people who are used to being, not in good places, but being in Egypt, they have food, they have water, they have places to sleep. And now you bring this whole group of people they from Egypt into the wilderness. Now they must live and fend for themselves. So a lot of arguments ensued as we went along this journey. But when they got to Mount Sinai, and Moses went up to the mountain, spoke to God. God gave him the details of the tabernacle, and he came down to build this thing. The Bible tells us it took about two years. So they sat in Mount Sinai for almost two years to gather all the, all the stuff they needed, all the wood, all the gold, all the instruments, all the workers for each particular part. It took about two years. And they built this whole tabernacle. And God told Moses, when it was finally built, to place each instrument in the tabernacle. And when he did, it said that the glory of God came and filled the whole tabernacle. Man, amazing. For the whole tabernacle. Because now they finally had a place where it was a mobile center where God would move with them. The thing though is, they had to build it first at a stationary place. But then God tells them, gather up, take it apart, put it in your bag, and we're gonna move this way and this way and that way. So you build it and you, ah, it's done, it's over with. Then we got to break it down again and move it over and over and over and over for 40 years. How tedious would that be? You had to pack up your house every so often and just move. Then set up, move again, over and over and over for 40 years. That's what they did. Imagine, though, the visual of a dirty desert, rocky place, you know, scorpions, animals all around, and you have in the middle of the desert, you have this huge, white, bright instrument in front of you, which is the outer core, the walls, the curtains with the poles, and you can see now a very bright, pure instrument amongst a dirty environment. Will it draw you to it? So I know what he was doing. So the colors of the tabernacle was Pacific. God had him chose white colors, purple, blue, and red. What does that mean? Of course, white is purity. And we have a white and um, blue, which is heavenly or divinity. And you have purple, which is royal. 
And of course, red, specific. God chose red to illustrate and to show the reason power of the blood that will come. That's all it had, all those four colors, that was it, the whole tabernacle. And it was put together, and this is the basic picture of how it looks. In the front of it was a gate. Matter of fact, it was literally three gates in the tabernacle. It was one to enter the outer court, one to enter the holy place, and another one to enter the most holy place. So God put three doors in this unit. Door, what is a door? In this instant right here, this door is Christ. He is the door. Bible tells us, I am the, John 10, 7, I am the door. If anyone comes in by me, he will be saved. So he's that door. So the first door enters in, when you enter in, you see one thing in front of you. This huge, large instrument, which is now <clears throat> the altar of burnt offerings. On this altar is when they will now kill the animal and they will burn everything here on this altar. It was huge. Imagine the flames in the desert. You will see from everywhere. Go even the flat lands. Some rocky right place here and there, and it's fire at nighttime. You will see it for miles. You will see it. And he put that right in the front. So something you can see from a distance, that bright light. What was that picture in front of Christ? That's the place of death. That's the cross. That's the cross. So the altar represents the cross. Now the cross, in the whole Bible, on the whole world to begin with, when there's an altar and you are bound to go meet the altar, the point is somebody will die at the altar. Chances of you escaping the altar is slim to none once you are bound. But in all the Bible, there's one person that escaped the altar. Not even Jesus, but one person escaped the altar. Who was that person that escaped the altar? Isaac. Isaac. And somebody died, something died in his place, right? The ram. Which is also a picture of Christ way before. He will die. But the old son will not escape because his sacrifice will be the last for everybody else. Which came before him and after him. He will be the last one to be sacrificed. So you move from there and you see the bronze laver, which is made of gold and it's round and it has water in it. Water. What's the picture of water in the Bible? You know what? Before I go to that, let's pause. So when you go here, the priest will wash their hands and feet for the walk into the holy place. Now, your hands, that refers to what you can do. And your feet represents where you go. So when you wash yourself, you are ready to be used and to go somewhere. So God tells us that the water represents the word. James tells us that the word is a mirror to us. You look into it. So you face the Bible. When you face the word of God, you look into a mirror and you begin to see yourself. Sometimes you like what you see. Sometimes you hate what you see. But you have no, you can't determine what you see or not because the word is what it is. It's what it is. So these men had to wash themselves before they enter the holy place. The other part is that it was a circular motion. Circular motion. In the Bible, whenever you see circles, I want you to just think of eternity. Whenever you see a circle, think about eternal stuff. So the word of God is what? It's eternal. It's eternal. Same with the rainbow, right? It represents eternity. The rainbow is circular. We see half here, but from the, uh, the, from the vis visual of the feet, if you see a rainbow from the sky, it is perfectly round. Perfectly round. So God brought an eternal thing from heaven into the earth, which is the rainbow, to show us that he is eternal and what he has promised his people will last forever. That's what he did with the rainbow. For in it, what we hear in the rainbow, real quick. A rainbow can only be visualized, as said, if the sun shines through rain at a 42 degree angle. 
That's it. No other angle. 42 degree angle specifically. Now Christ is the 42nd generation of Adam. He is the promise to all of Israel that will save them. So the rainbow is shown to say that this one that will come who will receive and save everybody. God said it's a promise. He didn't, he didn't waver from it. It's bound to happen no matter what. So in the labor, we see a circular object which tells us this is an eternal picture to visualize when you take yourself and you open up the word and you enter in and you receive promises. It is eternal. Say, can I snatch it from you? It's yours. God said it himself. So the Bible is that vital to us. I could go on and on about the Bible, but I know sometimes it gets daunting, so I'm going to move on. But you get the idea, right? We clear. When you pass <clears throat> the bronze lever, you will go through, you will go through, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you will go through the holy place. In front of the holy place was five pillars in the front of the holy place. And five, the number of grace. God gave us fivefold ministry that will support and hold up the church. These beings, these pillars, supported and held up the holy place for you walk in. That's the second door to walk in. And when you go into this tabernacle now, on your right hand side, you see a table of showbread. Left hand side, you see the um, lampstand, the golden lampstand. And this lamp has seven. Let's go back, there we go. Has seven wicks, seven arms. Now represent the number seven, which is perfect, and also a seven of creation. And God put it here to remind them the whole thing was done in seven days, and you are a perfect people. Yes, you will fall. Yes, you will go through your problems, but as long as this light shines in this dark room, it will illuminate everything. So this small group of people, if they will allow themselves to shine and let Christ shine through them, they will illuminate the whole world. So he tells us that you are the light of the world. You are the light. So it's as simple as knowing this and believing it, but even before you even believe it or not, you still are. You still are. Because all through your day, all through your week, your environments that are usually tough, uncomfortable, hard, boring, distressful, like, just add the word to it. And in all those moments, you are put there for a reason and a purpose. Your light will shine. Somewhere, somehow, somebody will see you and say, man, that's different. I don't know what it is about this person, but something is there that I need. It just, they're so, so happy. Even when they go through a bad time, they're still able to take a deep breath, bring it down, and react normally. Something about people that believe in God. In the worst of times, you can find strength. You can draw his strength and still be cordial. You can see your enemies. The Bible says, love your enemies. That is some tough words. When my enemy hurts me, to love them, that's easy. But God said, be perfect in this as I am perfect. So we are able to love perfectly. Let me say it again. You are not perfect, but you are able to love perfectly like he loves. So you hear the stories all the time of random people doing acts of kindness to people they usually would not care for or love. What's all this about? Remember years ago, it made the news when um, <clears throat> an older gentleman fell into a train tracks, a white man, and a black man jumped on the train tracks, covered him, held him down, and the train went over their heads. This was about eight years ago. It made the news. And all the social media, they'll say, oh, man, can you believe that? A black guy will jump in and risk his life for a white man. I'm like, why is it about race? Why is it about race? It's about seeing somebody in need and taking care of it. Taking care of it. If you, if you can help, you help. But when you can love the way God loves, he, there's no boundaries in what you, who you see. There's no boundaries in what you expect from people. You just react. You just act. You've been here before when somebody hurts you in a particular way that was very significant to you, and yet you felt bad for them, in a sense? Like you want to hurt them back, 
You just, you just can't. What, what is that? Usually, eye for eye, right? Tooth for tooth. But you hurt me, and now I'm feeling some kind of remorse for you. What is that? That's the love of God that's inside of you that our own mind cannot comprehend or understand. Is that amazing? Is that amazing? And you can still let them in. You can still embrace. You can still smile, even though you were hurt, because we are not meant to hold hurt. We are meant to love the way he loves. Because he loves such a way that he did what? He died. Do you know we can do the same thing ourselves right now? Not physically dying, but dying for somebody in the way you react, dying for somebody in the way you see them. Every single day, you are allowed to die for somebody. Because when you do these things, you now begin to have an idea of what he felt when he came. You now put yourself now in his place, and you live the way he lived, and the pattern and the practice becomes easier and easier and easier. And when you're in the group, people who do the same thing, it's contagious in the group setting. When you're by yourself, times it's harder. When you hear stories in the room, families, friends, like, you know what? I could do the same thing. And it helps. That's the importance of being in group settings, of not forsaking the body, the Bible tells us. When you come in, you hear things, and you're allowed to experience and visualize real life. People hurt, and they still choose to love. <clears throat> so the last stand, you are the light of the world. Across that room is the table of showbread. There was a table <clears throat> that has six loaves of um, bread stacked two together. I mean, six together, side by side. Which represents six is the number of man to begin with. Man was created on the sixth day. But the whole 12 in total represented the whole tribe of Israel. So God put it here to show them, this is you. But the man in the, in the wilderness, you were going to pick it every day. On the sixth day, you pick for the seventh day. The matter you pick today will not last till tomorrow. It will rot. So for instance, you need fresh manna every single day. But this manna lasts you seven days. It was changed once a week, a week. How come this one did not rot, but the other ones did? Because if bread is to feed your body, what is this bread intended to feed? Your spirit. So this one lasts longer and the other ones. So God was telling them, you shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from my mouth. So this was shown to them as a representation of his presence. That's the one thing that will guide you and move you along, and it will sustain you beyond your normal flesh, be sustained. The word of God sustains us. So the table of showbread was on the other side, so they will make sure they see this table. Jesus would tell the Pharisees, I am the bread of life come down from heaven. That said, Moses gave us manna in the wilderness. And Jesus said, yes, your answer is a manna and still died. He said, but if you eat of me, and if you drink of me, you shall never die. That's the kind of food we need, right? That food that when you, you ingest, when you take in, it brings life to you. It restores you, changes your mind, the way you see yourself, the way you see each other, the way you see God. Because on an average Sunday, somebody in here sees somebody else in some particular way, and you know it's not right. It happens. Let's be real. We home. When we family, right? We here. It happens. The more you ingest of his presence, the more he detracts those from you. Right, Danielle? Extract? Well, that's what it was, right? the more he does that from you. Those bad things, takes it away out of you, the more you ingest of him. Therefore, you know it, you're able to see each other now the way he sees them. And in that kind of pattern and family, everybody elevates. Nobody's left behind, nobody's killed to the side, everybody feels a part of something. Because now, the presence of God, 
is now amongst all of us, and we can eat of it and go on. Right before, after the holy place, <clears throat> right at the end of it, before you move to the next room, is the altar of incense. This altar burned continuously with perfume and sweet aroma. It filled the room all the time, filled the room. And the idea was, when you walk in, smell something good, you feel better, and you relax. The Bible tells us, in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's 10, no, 2.15, that we are a sweet aroma unto God. Our life is a sweet aroma unto him. In Revelation, it tells us that the prayers of the saints are a sweet aroma, and it's in heaven right now, our prayers. So this incense represents our prayers to God, but it's right before the most holy place. I need you to catch that. Your prayer goes from this world to the next. It connects you to the heavenlies. So it's right before the veil. So the veil separates the holy place from the most holy place. And in this room, when you walk in, before the room, let's talk about the veil real quick. So the veil in itself was a huge curtain. I covered separate the two rooms. And this curtain was when you enter this through this curtain, you are now in the most holy place. But in the Bible tells us that the veil is also Christ's body. When he was torn for us, his side was torn. It became a veil that allowed us to come in. So in the Bible, there's two stories of men that have their sides open, correct? There's the first Adam and the second Adam, which is Christ. In the first Adam, his side was open for what reason? He was put to sleep and a woman came out of the side, correct? And after that, we are all here now for that one act. We are all here. So by the time Christ come along, and his side is open, it's not to pull out another woman, it's to reinsert the bride back in. So the church now is part of his body. Now we are one, once again. What was once lost, sin trying to destroy, Christ redeemed on the cross, brought together by one act. So the veil is his side. When that veil is open, and you walk through that veil, you're in the most holy place, and you visualize now an instrument. No, not today. I guess not. There we go. Visualize an instrument <clears throat> called the Ark of the Covenant, who's not the presence of God, was in this box. As you see, it has two angels on top of it, and their wings are touching. This represents community, represents a picture of things that are beyond the earth, because it's angels. But yet, it was on earth with man. When you see this box, you see the poles on the side of it. And it was intended to have four priests hold this pole when they walk around their own wilderness. The reason why four men could hold it and visualize where they're going and carry it safely. This is how God intended his presence to be carried. No other way. No other way. That's how he intended it to be carried. And inside the box were three things. Very important things. First one, the Ten Commandments. What that represents? The law of God, of course. His word. Another one was um, the pot of manna which again is the bread of life. It's to show them and remind them that he, he brought food from the sky to fall to the ground to feed them. They didn't have to grow it, they didn't have to farm it, it came every single day, which means you now could depend and have your trust on God and rely on him. Even when it's tough, he will take care of you. He will bring his blessings from heaven to earth and it will shower down on you here on earth. He did it before, and he's reminding them, do not forget that I could do this at any given moment. I could take care of you. Don't worry about your life, Bible says. Look at the birds. 
I feed them every day. How more important are you compared to birds that you should worry, that you should be afraid or concerned what to eat, what to wear, where to sleep? Why are you worried? You know why we worry? Because we lose sight. Sight changes everything. You lose sight. You worry because you think that I must do something to create. I'm not saying no, don't worry. Don't, hit me carefully. I'm not saying sit home, say, hey, God, take care of you. I'm fine now. Like, I'm not saying that either <laughs> at all. <laughs> I'm just saying the fact that you get to trust him and rely on him for every single thing. Yes, it gets tough, of course. When you decide for yourself, I'm going to try this. He will show up. He will move according to your faith to help build you up, help lift you up, little by little by little. And your, your faith will grow and grow like a muscle. You work on it, it grows. You don't work on it, it stays where it is. That's what it is. So, the next one was Aaron's rod. This is the last piece that's in the Ark of Covenant, Aaron's rod. Now, this rod was a part of a branch that was cut from a tree. So you have a rod that budded, that sprouted, that grew leaves and almonds, a rod. Because usually, if you cut something from a source, it will die, right? But this one didn't die. What, was it, what, what is it saying about these people? That you are resurrected people. You will be raised. Even though you are cut off, you will be raised. Because at any moment, if you realize a vine can live without the branches, but a branch cannot live without the vine. No way, never. But this one lived. God brought life into this. We show the people that if you are ever cut off, if you are ever not sure or feel like you are just not part of this whole thing, you have life in you. Because the source of your life is not from yourself. Right? It comes from somebody else. It comes from God himself into your life. And it, and it feeds you. It holds you up. It gives you life. You can bear fruit wherever you go. So that was part of the tabernacle. <clears throat> in the middle, in the tabernacle, was actually set in the middle of the whole camp of Israel. God had them see and put it all together and he set them around their own tabernacle from east, <coughs> north, south, and west. Each tribe in particular places. Judah was at the east, which is the entrance gate. He was at the east. Of course, Judah came from Christ, came from Judah. So that's very specific in what God did in the whole arrangement of the camp. But it was set in this particular way where there was a whole group of people set in camps, going north, whole group, going west, whole group going east, and whole group going south. So the visual picture of this camp coming down from the mountain off of the aerial view will be this. Kill that whole thing, huh? Come on. It will be, it went up? Not on here, oh man, okay. There we go. So <laughs> the aerial view of the camp, the arrangement, looks like this. You think it's intentional? What God was doing from the beginning? Very, very intentional. Nothing is a mishap. Nothing just coincidentally happened. It was all intentional. And he will have the tabernacle, the presence of his presence, be in the center of the cross. The whole thing has always been about Christ. And since we are in him, the whole thing has always been about us. Because you are found in him. You don't live outside of him. If you're outside of him, you are dead. But if you live in him, you have life and life abundantly. If you are in him. So this is the picture that when you leave home with today. is the fact that even though we live in a world and a time that is separated from this, the more you get to know about your God, about your Lord, the more you know him, the more you know yourself. 
The more you know your neighbor, the more you know understand what you could do for this time. And if we understand that each piece represented Christ, and we are found in those pieces, there's a particular purpose for each thing. How it was created, how it was put together, and how it all worked out for the benefit of everybody else. And when God said, get up and move, get up and move. And at night time, you had a fire above you. Because when it's dark, when you're in a dark world, you need light. You can still see and move around in the dark world. Then when it's daytime and it's sunny and scorching hot in the desert, you have a cloud covering. You have a shade over you. And God showed them this for 40 years. And he will always guide you in a tough time and he will shelter you when it gets too hot. And you will never be in need. So this is a word today. That you understand that you should never, ever think you have less than. We live in a bloated world. We have so much. We all realize it. We have so much. Even the least of us have too much. We have storage for our stuff. It sits there for months and we pay for them. We pay for it. So you got to afford the money to store things and forget about it. So whenever it comes up, go to your basement. You find things you didn't use in 10 years. <laughs> you will see these things. 30, right? <laughs> we have a lot of stuff. So you are never in need. You are never in lack. Because your father loves you. I intend to give you all that you need and some to bless those around you. Because whatever you have is not only for you, right? If you have more of something, God is saying, hey, take a look at your brother, your sister. They may need this thing you have too much of. So pay attention. Ask God, what is this for? What is that for? Who could I bless with this? Just look around. But do not think you have too little. But we have a lot. We have a whole lot. I grew up in Nigeria, trust me, we have a whole lot here. I've been to Iraq, we have a whole lot here. A whole lot. It makes no sense. But, we human beings. We human beings, these things happen. But just know that God has you. And whatever you will need, he already know it, and he already have a plan to bring it to you. It's on the way. If it's a, if it's a need, it's on the way. If it's a want, might be a delayed delivery on that one if it's a want. But needs are on the way. You will have food, you have clothes for your back, and you have a place to stay. He will take care of you. But at the same time now, look around, take everybody else around you. So if you please stand, let's pray. We thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Father God, for speaking to us today. Allow us to receive from your mouth, Father God, the bread of heaven. Father God, watch over us, Father God, that we will be pure and cleansed in your sight, Lord. And Father, as we begin to see all the components of the Christ had a specific purpose, that we will see in our own lives, Father God, that you put us here with a purpose, Father God, a plan, and we will walk into certain things for you here on earth, Jesus. And Lord God, as we go by day today, that we will know that we have a, um, <clears throat> a job to do today, Father God. In particular, something must be done by us today, Lord God. And we will allow you to live through us and accomplish these things wherever we go. That we will see our brothers and sisters, Father God, that are in need. We will be able to help out. We will be able to give to them, Father God, what you've given to us. And we will allow you, Father God, to take from our hands and give to those around us. And your love will be so clear. And be so evident, Father God, that the world will not look in here and say, I don't see anything of love here. But they will look in your house and they will see your love in your house, Father God. And you'll be able to have a, a peaceful and joyous smile on your face when you look at the church, Father God. For we love each other and we try to do the best for those around us. And we will have our lives shine bright to give you glory. So Jesus, watch over us today. Let our lives shine in the dark world, Father God, that we could be your light. Jesus, I pray, Lord God.
Amen.